Welcome to the uh, Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Today we have the pleasure of introducing, I have the pleasure, I'm Michael Irwin, the director of the Kaza Center. Pleasure of introducing Sahib Khalsa, MD, PhD. He is the director of clinical operations at Laureate Institute of Brain Research, and he's going to be talking with us about the anxious self and interceptive processes. I've known uh, Sahib for probably 15 years or so. He was a very important faculty here in the anxiety disorders program. He went to Laureate Institute, has been there for the last five or 10 years. Nine, like years. Nine years. So he's really remarkably productive, publishing over 80 articles. He has one R01 looking at processes of interception and the relationship with anxiety. He's really led this field about how interceptive processes and how what we experience in ourselves can lead to changes in our feelings of anxiety and the underlying mechanisms. So we're really delighted to have him talk with us today and share some of his research. I'm not going to go into all of his, his accomplished, so I want to leave time for him to show, talk with us about what he's found. Welcome, Sadiq. Thank Thanks, you. Man. Okay. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's great to be back here. Um, Physically, I understand this is one of the first uh, Grand Rounds that's back in person. Uh, the first, uh, Michael Gitlin says, so um, glad to be here with colleagues uh, in person and, and afar, uh, familiar faces and new ones as well. Um, so I've got a lot of content that I'm going to try to cover, and I'll apologize for glossing over some background details if you're interested. Um, I gave Grand Rounds at uh, UCLA uh, about a year and a half ago as well. There's some more introductory content that you might find uh, there, but what I what I sort of tasked for myself was uh, a bit of a broad uh, concept. So the title for the talk is "Balancing the Anxious Self: Navigating the Interoceptive and Digital Realms." And this uh, word cloud is just a, a illustration of um, a lot of the words from the various manuscripts that I've published um, to date, just to give you a sense of kind of what I've been up to. Um, I'd like to start by hopefully getting my slides to work. There we go. Um, to just thank my many uh, colleagues, trainees, collaborators, um, uh, funding agencies, uh, and special thanks to Mike Irwin and the Cousin Center and uh, Helena Hansen uh, and UCLA Seminole Institute for the invitation to be here. Uh, none of this work would, that I'm going to show you would be possible without them. In terms of financial disclosures, um, I have no financial disclosures pertaining to this presentation. Uh, my research is funded by the NIH. I'm on some uh, executive boards, um, perform some consulting not related to this work. And also just a warning uh, that some this presentation may contain some artificial intelligence generated images. So if you're already a bit sensitive to seeing those flashed around, you're gonna see a few more here, uh, get ready. <clears throat> so uh, here are the learning objectives for today. Uh, I'm not gonna go through and read them uh, in detail. They were part of the announcement. Um, what I wanna start with uh, is uh, sort of the notion of two worlds that we live in. Um, sort of uh, a physical world uh, that you see depicted on the left and then a digital world uh, that we see depicted on the right. I have a five-year-old and I increasingly uh, am finding that um, it's important to, for me to help him navigate the notion of these two worlds and how there can be an overlap um, and an intersection, but they're not uh, exactly the same. So there's been a dramatic increase over the past 20 or 30 years in the amount of, of content uh, in the digital world. Um, it's vying for attention from our eyeballs and our brains. Um, and uh, and our body, our nervous systems, our physiology are kind of stuck in the middle. Um, and there's, uh, I believe, a balance that needs to be navigated. Um, and I'm going to share with you some societal as well as research-related context for that. Um, we're talking about interoception. So it's uh, the process by which the nervous system senses, interprets, and integrates signals originating from within the body. This is a, a definition uh, from a conference that I was lucky enough to lead. Um, and this is something that uh, spans conscious and unconscious uh, uh, levels. It's something relevant for animals, uh, not just humans. Uh, but if you look in the literature, you can see interoceptive awareness. A lot of people who are studying in humans are the conscious experience. So if you uh, think about the feeling of your heartbeat, the feeling of your uh, breath, the feeling of your stomach or digestive system, something that you can report on. Um, uh, those of you who are clinicians certainly um, are attentive to this uh, in clinical settings. Now, um, our uh, internal uh, organ systems are, are not uh, uh, the uh, physiologic workhorses. They act as broadcasters, sending sophisticated signals that rhythmically navigate our, our nervous system. 
And these usually operate below the threshold of consciousness, but they come into sharp focus uh, when the body's physiology is disrupted or when threat. Um, and using hierarchical and feed forward mechanisms that you see depicted on the top right, the brain then builds precise models of the body in the external world, in this case, mostly the physical world. Uh, these models enable individuals to anticipate potential outcomes and take preventive or corrective actions focused on controlling aversive ones. Uh, this is not a process that is restricted to humans. Uh, other animals do it too. And it's a viable method for study. So, uh, okay. um, so here's an example in the middle of, of an inference control loop that's cast as a hierarchical Bayesian model. I'm not going to go into the details, but just suffice to say that what's important here is that um, sensory signals are filtered between what are called prediction errors, um, as well as uh, the, the nervous system's prediction of uh, what is anticipated to happen, models of the, of the body and the world, and forecasting come into play that influence um, various manner in which uh, we consciously and unconsciously expect what we're going to see. Uh, and on top of that, there's a layer of metacognition. So um, these kinds of computational models are increasingly studied in relation to psychiatric disorders, um, and they're increasingly um, uh, bridged um, in terms of interoception and extraception um, that combined yield a percept of, of your body within its environment that informs your optimal action selection. So you have actions that you can select that are both internally directed towards modulating your viscera, but also externally directed that take you into different environments and, and lead you to engage with different sorts of stimuli. Um, this is a recent review that is um, worth just checking out at your own time. Um, it provides a, a lot of uh, information about uh, particular uh, pathways of interoception. Uh, the number of pathways is actually growing over time. Um, it's a very broad area. It's a bit of a complex area because, uh, as these authors indicate, interoceptive rhythms contribute for a variety to a variety of functions ranging from perceptual detection up to the sense of self. Uh, and there is a competition between internal and external inputs. Um, I've done some work uh, trying to illustrate what are some of the brain regions that are involved in interoceptive processing. So people used to simply equate interoception with the insula, but there's a variety of reasons for which um, there's a, a number of brain regions that are beyond the insular cortex depicted here. Um, and there's actually some specificity that we're learning in terms of cardiorespiratory interoception may not involve the same uh, uh, regions as um, gastrointestinal. And here was a paper published in Science a couple weeks ago showing that actually olfactory bulb neurons have very fast millisecond level uh, representations of the heartbeat. This is another uh, paper that uh, simply makes the point that symptoms, so kind of the, the um, consciously experienced uh, problems that patients bring into the clinic uh, are really at the top of this hierarchy of uh, Im implicit and explicit processing. Um, and uh, uh, I would argue that interoception uh, offers the ability to at least connect some of the types of symptoms that uh, our patients report to us in clinical settings with an underlying physiology and a neurobiology, which is very different from what you get in traditional diagnostic frameworks. So um, my take home message number one uh, for this talk is um, uh, the, the notion that uh, perturbing peripheral organ system signals is an optimal way to understand how interoceptive neurocircuitry causes symptom perception or aspects of symptom perception to occur in a disorder relevant fashion. And I'll illustrate that in, with some of the data. Um, we'll start with the cardiorespiratory domain. Um, and first, just with a simple um, uh, ask, if you can just pay attention to your heartbeat right now without taking your pulse, see if you can feel it. I don't have, I guess I can show of hands who can feel it. Okay, so about. 60%, I don't know about the online audience. So about 60% of you can feel it just by simply directing your attention to your body. Um, in doing so, you probably activated regions like the insular cortex, as well as your somatosensory cortex. And if you're better at doing that, maybe you are activating that re region of the brain a, a little bit better. Um, we've learned a, a lot about um, the visceral uh, and somatosensory pathways that contribute to your ability to, to feel that sensation. But it turns out, uh, I hate to break it to you, most of you are actually uh, probably not feeling your heartbeat. Um, only about one in three people or really when you put them under rigorous testing methods um, can feel their heartbeat under resting um, circumstances. 
And that's true um, whether or not you are um, an experienced meditator. We've done some studies. It's also true whether or not you have uh, somebody else's heart. Uh, it turns out heart transplant patients have about the same level of ability. Now you're probably saying, well, I, I know what my heartbeat feels like. What are you talking about? And if you think about situations in which you have a, a strong cardiovascular sensation, it's probably not sitting here um, uh, in an audience, uh, virtual or physical, uh, but maybe when you're giving a talk or you're exercising, you're riding a roller coaster, sexual activity, et cetera, anxiety. So um, I've taken that approach into my lab to try to study um, how we perceive our heartbeat sensations uh, and taking advantage of um, the hypothalamic uh, pituitary adrenal uh, axis signaling. Um, and over the last 15 years, I've established this experimental medicine framework that allows us to safely measure interoceptive processing in humans um, and how humans feel their heartbeat sensations, both um, healthy individuals and intact. So um, we know a lot about how cortisol signals uh, to the brain. We know relatively less about epinephrine or norepinephrine. Uh, but using a, a medication called isoproteranol, which is a peripherally acting beta adrenergic agonist, um, we can actually um, exogenously man manipulate um, states of cardiorespiratory arousal. It's an old asthma medicine that increases heart rate and heart contractility and also bronchodilates. Um, and as we've shown in a variety of studies, you get really nice uh, precision control uh, over heart rate responses with different doses. Um, and uh, we implemented this dial rating, which allows us to um, evaluate sort of what you're feeling in real time. We can use placebo infusions so we can control for the effects of expectation. Um, and what I would point out is that some infusions increase the sensation quite a bit, others not so much, um, but I can confidently take um, any individual um, and increase their heartbeat sensation to the point where you're definitely feeling something that was modulated um, and it's localized uh, to a plausible region of the body. So we've done this um, now in the fMRI scanning environment. Here's an example of what it looks like at LIBOR. Um, where you have a, a nurse administering the infusion. Um, and this is actually was our first fMRI study. Um, I'd like to highlight this one because this was published uh, based on data collected here at UCLA over at Staglin. Uh, and what we showed was that when you activated uh, heart rate responses in a dose-related manner to increase everyone's feeling of sensation at a two microgram dose, um, we saw what people kind of expected, which is that the insular cortex was, was singularly and maximally, maximally responsive to this modulation. So that has helped to sort of give us a better sense of ground zero for cardiac and respiratory sensation. We've uh, done a lot more since then. Um, this is all the papers that I've published to date using this methodology. I'm not gonna go into all the details. Um, I would like to highlight one study in relation to generalized anxiety disorder that we published a couple of years ago now, um, where we looked uh, at whether or not people with uh, GAD uh, were more sensitive to uh, perceiving heartbeat signals as you would expect from clinical experience. And it turns out that um, basically they showed a uh, heightened heart rate response, but not universally. You can see that there were no differences over here with this two microgram dose, uh, but really at this sort of sub-threshold dose that, that some people feel uh, sometimes, and, but not everybody feels. Um, and when we looked at perceptual awareness with this dial rating, you could see that Indeed, uh, on a second-by-second -second basis, we could see that um, the patients with GAD uh, were indeed experiencing um, a, a heightened uh, sensory uh, state that we were manipulating. In terms of the neurobiology of this, um, we did see uh, what we expected, uh, dose-related um, insular cortex uh, activation, but we surprisingly didn't see any group differences in the response. Um, instead, what we saw was a um, at this 0.5 microgram dose, was a differential activation of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. In this case, a hypoactivation. Um, and uh, that the degree of hypoactivation actually tracked very uh, well with the sensation. Um, so we sort of interpreted this uh, as uh, to indicating that autonomic hyperreactivity and GAD might reflect a failure of the VMPFC, which is kind of a regulatory visceromotor region um, to constrain lower moderate levels of arousal. Not that at the two microgram dose, uh, we could sort of uh, overwhelm the system's capacity, but the idea was with the, the 0 0.5 microgram dose, we were seeing this differential engagement. So I believe these findings um, open up new ground in terms of our understanding of interoceptive neurocircuitry, um, and they uh, point towards a potential therapeutic application in terms of maybe focusing on neuromodulation of this region um, in, a, in an effort to um, uh, modulate uh, anxiety. Um, 
We have done additional work uh, since we published this, just showing that uh, under resting conditions even, there seems to be an abnormal uh, and consistent uh, link in the functional connectivity between the insula and the VMPFC. Uh, this was using uh, a Bayesian um, confirmation uh, approach. Uh, what was interesting as well is that the degree of functional connectivity um, was associated with something called um, anxiety sensitivity, which um, it's not really uh, what somebody reports how anxious they are in the moment. It's really uh, asking somebody about what are the triggers of your anxiety. And it's a much more metacognitive level, sort of going back to that sort of symptoms at the, at the top of the metacognitive loop. Um, we continued doing uh, further exploration of this data set. Uh, it, it turns out uh, we collected that data um, in uh, both concurrently with EEG and fMRI signals, and there is something called a, a heartbeat uh, evoked potential, where we were able to uh, identify that um, not only were the brains of the GHD individuals um, showing a heightened responsivity on um, imaging, but also with the electrophysiologic signal, they, they showed a heightened response um, to this um, modulation, again, restricted to the 0 0.5 microgram dose. So the brain is sort of electrophysiologically tracking heartbeat signals in a, in a manner um, in this patient group that's different. Um, and in this paper, we actually show that the electrophysiologic signal actually doesn't correlate with the bold fMRI data. So there may be actually multiple um, indicators or multiple ways that the brain is able to kind of uh, measure this uh, cardiovascular signal. Okay, so moving on to an, another study. Um, uh, what I asked you to do uh, initially was to sort of pay attention, sort of use your top-down attention, um, engage it towards your heartbeat si uh, signals. Uh, but I've also shown you data um, where we manipulate uh, in a bottom-up manner the cardiovascular state. So this was a paper where we took our data and combined it and said, okay, what areas of the brain are actually involved in the um, co-activation across these different tasks? Because Sometimes you might look for a signal in your body, but there is nothing to be felt. Sometimes you feel something and it sort of catches your attention, but you know, where in the brain is the intersection of these processes happening? Um, so we, we took a transdiagnostic approach uh, across anxiety, depression, and eating disorders. The reason will become clear in a second. Um, and what we found uh, was again, the insular cortex um, showing this co-activation response. So not just directing your attention, but also um, regions of the brain that were responsive to the bottom-up modulation. Um, but we found a uh, hemispheric asymmetry. So in this case, um, the dysgranular mid-insula um, showed a uh, left versus rightward uh, asymmetry in the, in the localization and amount of co-activation. Um, why did we do that? Um, because earlier, uh, a few years ago, uh, Camilla Nord uh, and colleagues published an fMRI meta-analysis in AJP that sort of identified across existing um, studies of imaging studies of interoception in various psychiatric disorder samples, um, the mid-insular cortex popped out. But nobody had actually done a, a study where we actually look on an individual subject basis where everybody did um, all of these tasks uh, together. So this was kind of corroborative uh, evidence. Um, one other thing to mention uh, before we move on to other uh, other um, um, interoceptive signals is that um, so I've talked about bottom up and top down processes, but um, when you think about adrenergic arousal, um, your brain is often sending signals that trigger uh, physiologic or sympathetic arousal states. Um, and it does that uh, via communication with the autonomic nervous system, and it can directly influence the heart. Um, well, this is a, uh, an example of, a, of an approach um, that some of the cardiology colleagues here have um, uh, pioneered to uh, study the, what happens when you actually cut some of the sympathetic fibers that uh, interrupt the brain's ability to drive um, cardiovascular state. So it turns out that um, that's very effective at reducing um, uh, arrhythmia uh, uh, events in people who are at risk of sudden cardiac death. Um, and we studied whether um, that uh, also a procedure had an impact on reducing anxiety, which it did. Um, and this was uh, done with uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Olu Ajijala and uh, Kalyanam Shivkumar here at UCLA. Um, but what you can see is that uh, symptoms of depression and PTSD weren't really impacted. Um, and so this led us to conclude that screening and longitudinal surveillance uh, of the mental health of arrhythmia patients is warranted um, to understand and, and improve their mental health. 
Um, and back when I was a resident and junior faculty member, we actually uh, implemented a care model for these patients. So here's the reference if you're interested. So um, we can modulate anxiety, but perhaps not PTSD and depression symptoms as well. Um, this is just a schematic of, of sort of the, the putative neurocircuitry that's most commonly supported for cardiac interoception. Um, the fact that uh, PTSD is, is, um, is, uh, is not particularly um, impacted has led us to think a little bit more about why that might be. And this is a paper um, where we review the potential um, reasons for uh, why interoception is integrally involved in uh, interoception and fear learning. So you have to take into account the interoceptive and extraceptive context of the individual, uh, what sort of predictive processing phenotype and awareness traits, and, and sort of what are some of the allostatic set points. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that if you're interested in learning more. Okay, we have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to keep going and <laughs> we'll try to move along. So um, I'm going to touch very briefly on respiratory interoception. There's, uh, I have a lot more um, studies than I have time to show, um, but I just wanted to use this opportunity to uh, indicate um, uh, one study uh, in particular that's going through our review process. Um, and this is uh, capitalizing on the notion that you have kind of different respiratory networks. So uh, dyspnea and feelings of breathlessness are, are key aspects of anxiety and, and we all automatically breathe. But unlike our heartbeats, we have the ability to actually voluntarily hold our breaths. Maybe you could try that right now. Or you could take a deep breath and you could see sort of what uh, feeling does that give you. Sometimes people, when they breathe slowly and deeply, they feel less anxious. We use deep breathing techniques. Uh, but sometimes um, when you have people breathe rapidly, they feel anxious. And so we don't really have a good sense of what these uh, voluntary respiration brain regions are. Um, and so this is a, an, a, an early study, or an early attempt using a lesion model um, from some data uh, collected at the University of Iowa, where we took patients who had uh, acquired focal brain damage to regions that are um, somewhat overlapping with these voluntary respiratory regions and had them um, breathe uh, according to different rates um, with this sort of sinusoidal signal, we had a, a motor control test and we looked at their ability to regulate their breathing. We found some impairments. We also looked at their um, affect and we found that there was a selective deficit whereby the lesion patients um, experienced uh, increased anxiety during a, a, a focal range uh, of, of, um, of breathing. So, um, so this sort of suggests that tachypnea related anxiety might be a potential uh, heightened respiratory or affective sensitivity uh, in these patients uh, could also reflect a decreased capacity capacity to emotionally regulate tachypneic states following brain injury. Um, only other thing about breathing, uh, if you are interested, there was a, a very interesting uh, uh, YouTube uh, video uh, just last week or two weeks ago uh, called Breathing Matters um, held at UCLA. Uh, Jack Feldman and Helen Dubretsky are um, uh, studying breathing um, at sort of the, the level of animal models, Jack um, uh, I, uh, identified and helped name the pre botzinger complex um, that is involved in, um, in, in um, uh, automatic respiration, uh, but they have uh, expanded their focus to think about um, the role of voluntary breathing and, and emotion um, uh, in, in sort of uh, breathing neurocircuitry. So it's definitely a space to follow. Moving to gastrointestinal interoception. So the few points I wanted to make here. So it's almost the lunch hour um, and uh, you probably, uh, if you're back to in-person shopping in the post-pandemic era, you probably have seen an image like this and just maybe think about um, what that's like when you're really hungry or what it's like to shop when you're not hungry. And it's kind of a, a very different state. Um, and the point there is, is that there's different phases of eating um, and, and food consumption that, that start uh, well before you actually put food in your mouth. But um, we really don't understand a lot about how um, people's uh, consciously sense uh, interoceptive um, gastrointestinal signals. Um, we do have a, a, a rich literature from gastroenterology um, looking at various probes, balloons that you can swallow or electrodes that you can use to stimulate the stomach or the colon uh, or, the, or the rectum. But from a mental health standpoint, we actually have a pretty limited amount of knowledge and that's not a particularly helpful approach. So how could we develop um, uh, methods of studying gastrointestinal interoception in a minimally invasive manner? So the first, this review covers a bunch of them. I'm gonna talk about two regions in particular. 
Um, and this is sort of one slide covering about three years of work uh, from my lab uh, that culminated in this paper uh, that basically involves um, uh, a vibrating capsule that you can see here. Uh, so uh, working with a company called Vibrant that had developed this uh, technology for studying and ameliorating uh, chronic constipation, um, we had them change the timing parameters so that shortly after you swallowed it, um, it would start um, sending a, a vibration signal, use a button to sort of indicate whether or not people could feel it. And what you can see is that uh, most people could feel it above chance. And when we gave a stronger signal, you could um, measure a change in the perception. Um, it wasn't aversive, uh, it kind of feels like swallowing, um, maybe you have to shrink your cell phone down, turn it on vibrate and swallow it and somebody starts calling you. It's a strange sensation, but it is certainly a perceptible one. We localized it to the gastroduodenal uh, segments um, and identified a um, EEG uh, signature that we call the gastric evoked potential um, that doesn't uh, come from an area that you would uh, ascribe to the insula, uh, but more of a posterior um, uh, midline uh, region. Um, and there's some uh, associated neuroscience evidence that, um, that has identified something called the gastric network in the brain that's actually um, has a quite a different um, architecture and, and distribution. So this finding is consistent with that. Um, and the R01 that um, uh, Mike mentioned is um, basically focused on um, studying this in inpatients with anorexia nervosa and seeing whether we can detect uh, differences in, in gastrointestinal sensitivity that might reflect the kind of um, gastric hypersensitivity these patients report in clinical settings, but more importantly, whether we could use that to actually make predictions about um, clinical outcomes following discharge. Um, another uh, very societally relevant um, uh, uh, opportunity for studying gastric interoception that I wanted to mention is um, GLP-1 agonists. So I do have a, a crowd in uh, in person. So who's heard of GLP-1 agonists? Raise your hand. Okay. Who? So that's about 25%. Who knows somebody who's actually taking one of these things? About 20%. Okay. So, um, so what are these uh, medications? It's a class of medications approved by the FDA for weight loss and glycemic control. They mimic the effects of an endogenous hormone called GLP-1 that regulates insulin and glucagon secretion. Um, and it increases satiety. And it actually, you have a peripheral GLP-1 and you have a central GLP-1 in the normal physiologic state. Um, and uh, what these uh, GLP-1 agonists do is they cross the blood-brain barrier and they stimulate all available GLP-1 receptors in the body and in the brain, and they induce powerful um, uh, curves of appetite and weight loss, rivaling bariatric surgery, um, 10 to 20, up to 10 to 20 percent of weight loss within months. Uh, they've been associated with some reduced cardiovascular events and stroke. Most common symptoms are GI side effects, nausea, vomiting, bloating, etc. Um, uh, I put a question mark next to thoughts of self-harm because the, the mental health related um, suicide, as well as uh, anxiety and depression likelihood have been under increasing study, and there's less evidence for mental health uh, associated impacts in that regard. Um, so uh, what's important, uh, I think, from a neuroscience standpoint is that these, um, in the brain, uh, GLP-1 uh, neurons in the nucleus of the solitary tract, which is constantly implicated in interoceptive neurobiology, project in a sprinkler-like distribution to um, hypothalamic regions, but also dopaminergic regions. Um, and they may have a, a substantial role in, um, in some of the appetite curbing um, uh, reports. Now, these things are pervasively present. So this uh, is a uh, billboard in Oklahoma, driving down the highway, they're advertising it. Um, I turned a corner uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, and here's an empty lot awaiting development. They're advertising, it, it says lose up to 20 pounds in one month. Right. Uh, this was in Phoenix when I was on vacation. Uh, this is just on the side of the street at compounding pharmacy. So these things are getting a lot of societal traction. Um, they're under uh, increasing study from uh, uh, um, uh, the journalists uh, and even um, so last year at Saturday Night Live and there was an Oscar red carpet opening stretch, uh, opening sketch made a joke about, oh, I guess everybody in Hollywood had diabetes, you know. You know um, uh, and uh, you, this has even uh, touched UCLA. So there's a New York Times article um, that where the reporter uh, mentioned one of our own, uh, one of your own, uh, Jennifer Cruz, Dr. Jennifer Cruz, who's my residency classmate, um, who uh, I guess has uh, been using these medications um, in her clinic. And they were reporting on an email she had sent to, to perhaps some of you received. So um, 
So these things are, uh, are uh, available. Uh, with a colleague in uh, obesity medicine, Dr. Jesse Richards, um, we began studying the impact on binge eating. Um, and uh, this was a study published last year showing that um, semaglutide or uh, semaglutide with other um, anti-obesity medications showed a greater increase in reduction in binge eating scores in an open uh, sort of open label retrospective cohort study. This is just the individual um, outcomes. Um, now, even though there's some positive uh, data, um, he also began describing to me se several cases um, that were concerning where these patients, some of his patients started um, really substantially reducing their um, food intake um, down to 500 to 800 calories a day. And even though they had had weight loss, um, these individuals described a lot of uh, food-related aversion, um, and in some cases, even water aversion. Um, and so uh, this uh, perspective uh, that was recently published sort of describes some of those cases in further detail um, and uh, led us to sort of suggest a few um, uh, cautions and, and actions that people who are considering initiating a patient on a GLP-1 agonist. So screen people for potential eating disorder symptoms, both via a scale and via um, clinical history, monitor for these um, maladaptive responses, um, and then also look at a, at a broader level to see if there are additional health impacts. So if any of you are interested uh, or know people who are, are uh, intrigued by taking these or prescribing them, have a look at these. Okay, so for the last part of the talk, we're gonna step back a, a little bit. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time uh, in the physical world and um, now we're going to shift the focus to our relationship with the digital world. So, um, this is just a Google search for uh, pictures of adolescents taking selfies. Um, you may be uh, surprised to know that the first known use of the word selfie in any paper or electronic medium was basically 22 years ago, so September of 2002. Um, and although humans have always been interested in their appearance, um, the social aspects and the broad availability of digital cameras has led to an astronomical increase in, uh, in the human focus on depicting themselves, um, uh, but also the visual-based medium. The UN now reports there's more people with mobile phones, so 6 billion, than there are people with access to clean toilets, 4.5 billion. So um, there's quite a bit of a societal shift. Um, there's been some journalistic interest in trying to understand um, how, what's the best way to kind of curb this use and escape distractions, and this particular reporter <laughs> found the solution by taking their cell phone and just putting it in a lockbox. Um, there's actually a lot of these online that you can find um, where people are, are uh, developing products to try to help people um, to uh, reduce their uh, stimulation from technology. There's been um, some, some empirical work done on this, uh, a series of studies um, that uh, found that participants typically did not enjoy spending uh, time in a room by themselves. And in one experiment that um, many preferred to administer electric shocks uh, instead of being, al being left alone, which sort of led uh, it evoked this sort of this John Milton quote. Um, in, incidentally, in the study, it was mostly the men who were delivering the shocks. I'm not sure if there's a rationale for that, but that was what was reported in the study. Um, some of this interest in technology and 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 um, recent trends has made me reflect uh, on uh, this book that I read uh, back in 1992. So I'm a science fiction fan, and uh, it centers around a character named Hero who delivers pizzas uh, to the mansions for a living and, and, um, and has various uh, adventures, but spends most of his time when he's not working goggled into the metaverse um, where his avatar in the metaverse is actually, a, a led, he's a celebrity in the metaverse. Um, this was actually the, the, the book that gave us the term metaverse. Um, and so I decided to ask AI to <laughs> depict that over here. Um, so this is fictional, uh, but this is actually, this is what I found online, and it's, you, you tell me whether it looks, uh, there's, whether there are some similarities and, and um, some societal trends in our technologies that are intriguing. So this hopefully will come through as well. Uh, what was it, last month, Apple released the uh, Vision Pro, and so now we're seeing a lot of examples of people who are not content with just having their face in a device, but are actually um, walking around and uh, ordering things. This person is uh, stopping in the middle of the street. Uh, people are trying to work when they're on the subway. 
Um, this person's not, or he's definitely not exercising. Uh, so uh, this person is exercising, but he's kind of standing out in a pretty odd way. Um, and um, and then finally, there was this individual who decided he could afford a cyber truck, and then it was worth it to use it while he was driving. Um, and they got pulled over, and this prompted Secretary Pete Buttigieg to issue this uh, warning. So, um, so whether this is smart, uh, I think it's pretty clear it's it's not. But this is an example of what's happening um, uh, in in the modern world um, in our with our use of technology. So, um, we're not done there as a species. So uh, last week, uh, OpenAI released um, uh, Sora. Uh, has anybody? Show of hands who's seen Sora. Okay, two out of, so I would say 5% at most of this crowd. Check it out. It's basically uh, using text prompts, you can create uh, uh, videos that are super photorealistic to the point of being scary. So um, uh, it's not publicly available. You could just only see an example of it on the website. I'm not gonna, in the interest of time, show that. Um, but suffice to say that uh, our immersion in the digital world um, is uh, really rapidly growing, um, which leads to the question, are we creating tools faster than our nervous systems can adapt? Um, so this is just a prompt that I put in. Here's literally Pandora's box. I don't know why a coronavirus or something looking like that showed up there, but uh, that's what you get. Um, the question I have is, uh, what can we do about it? And um, I'll... Uh, I'll talk about that next. So um, this was an interesting tweet I came across a few years ago um, based on some anthropological work um, where uh, these uh, scientists were just sort of fastidiously noting what people were doing throughout the day. Um, and it turns out um, in these particular uh, hunter-gatherer uh, societies, the most common waking activity was actually doing nothing. And so I would ask you to think about when was the last time you spent a fair amount of time doing nothing, either in your daily uh, activities or uh, uh, when you're on vacation. Um, uh, were you meditating or were you just simply distracted the whole time? So um, I think that, uh, and I'll show some, some studies next, uh, but the take home message too for this talk is that um, there's value in perturbing nervous system signals by actually reducing extra receptive stimulation um, using something called flotation rest um, that may be uh, one way to help reestablish balance in the face of an increasingly anxiogenic world. So what is flotation rest? First, I'll show you the global prevalence of it. Um, there are float centers uh, that provide access to this uh, therapy um, uh, all over the world, mostly in the U.S., um, but you can see that the number of float centers that have begun uh, opening has increased in recent times, whether that's a reaction to some of this technology um, is unclear. Here's the growth of float centers in America. Typical duration of a float session is uh, 60 to 90 minutes. Um, and so uh, what is uh, the history of the development of this odd term um, in this timeline? So um, starts actually back in 1954 um, with uh, uh, two psychiatrists, Dr. John Lilly and Jay Shirley uh, at the National Institute of Mental Health, who um, created the initial version of this. Um, here is a, a, an example of an upright or vertical tank that uh, Jay Shirley at the Oklahoma City VA uh, created. This was back in the day when um, the U.S. was trying to send um, astronauts to the moon, and they were trying to simulate what would it be like to be in an environment um, devoid of light or sound um, when you go around the dark side of the moon uh, or an anti-gravity environment. So they were trying to simulate that effect with some of these chambers. But of course, it looks kind of scary, and uh, they thought that it would be. Uh, but it turns out some people, when they um, came out of this um, uh, immersion tank, felt quite relaxed. So that led to um, this first uh, uh, commercial uh, float tank. This was a horizontal float tank called the Sabadi. This one was uh, cardboard, but other ones subsequently were fiberglass. Um, this was developed in 1973. Um, and then in 1977, we had the first commercial float center, less than five miles away in Beverly Hills, which had five of these things. Um, and then uh, a few years later, uh, uh, you probably have, have some, if you've heard of this before, sensory deprivation things have an association with the film Altered States, uh, which was loosely based off of um, uh, some of uh, uh, um, John Lilly's uh, life um, and was kind of a cult classic. Um, 
Now there was uh, some research that happened um, in the 80s with these horizontal float tanks. So here is uh, Dr. John Turner taking uh, Dr. Tom Fine's blood pressure inside of a, a samadhi tank at the University of Toledo College of Medicine in 83. Um, but importantly, there was kind of a big gap um, until 2005, there was a meta-analysis of available data that suggested that there was some um, potential effect in the available literature, which is mostly older literature, uh, on reducing um, uh, uh, anxiety and, uh, and stress. Um, but it wasn't until 2014 uh, that my colleague uh, Justin Feinstein, uh, right here, um, uh, actually uh, moved to LIBOR, uh, Lower Institute for Brain Research, and uh, built this uh, open float pool with an interest in um, uh, studying the potential impact in um, uh, treating anxiety uh, in um, individuals with anxiety disorders. So um, almost a six decade gap between um, the building of that uh, float tank and some of the first publications in psychiatric samples. So I'd like to, in the last few minutes, just um, quickly walk you through some of those results and then open it up to questions. So um, here are the papers, um, all uh, eight of them uh, and growing. Um, so, uh, Justin built the open uh, flow pool with the um, in, uh, intuition, uh, and I think the wise one, that um, individuals um, who had anxiety disorders who might be more likely to have claustrophobia uh, wouldn't feel comfortable in sort of a coffin-style tank. Um, so, uh, this is the open uh, uh, pool that, uh, that he built um, and that would be used for studies. Um, so what, uh, what's interesting about this and what's unique about this uh, engineered environment, you can't see it from the slide, um, but if you uh, were to stand in this pool, it's, it's not a swimming pool, it's 11 inches of water, there's about 2,000 pounds of Epsom salt uh, dissolved in there, so more salt from the Dead Sea, your skin won't prune, uh, it'll feel actually more silky and smooth when you go in, when you lay down your body surface area increases and you just float effortlessly on the surface. Um, the water is heated to the same temperature as, as the surface of your skin, and the same is with the air, and the air um, is also a little bit more humid, so that in, uh, in the um, ideal state um, when you're floating, um, uh, from a thermoregulatory standpoint, you can't really tell where the air uh, and the water boundary um, exists. Um, the room itself is soundproofed, um, and when, uh, so you can't hear any uh, external noise, and then when you turn the lights off, you're in complete darkness not even a single photon of light hitting the retina. So um, you really can't even tell if your eyes are open or closed. Um, and the idea is, and the classic sort of description of this is sensory deprivation, right? because you're um, depriving your senses of external input. Um, but the question is, if you do that, and we know a lot about uh, the, neur the neural circuits for movement, for speech, tactile sensation, proprioception, hearing, and vision, you know, when you don't need to tread water to stay afloat, um, when you, there's nobody to talk to and there's no movement, um, we had an intuition uh, based on our experiences uh, with floating that there would be an increase in interoceptive um, sensation. And in fact, um, we found that. So this was a crossover study um, uh, of 30 anxious and depressed individuals who uh, floated in one condition and then uh, watched some neutral videos in another. Um, and you can see that they uh, reported increases in relaxation, serenity on the PANIS uh, scale, reductions in muscle tension, reductions in anxiety on the STAI, uh, and reductions in diastolic blood pressure. Oops. Um, uh, also, they reported increases in cardiorespiratory interception, so increased breathing and heartbeat sensations without an increase in stomach or digestive signals, increased sensation in their heartbeat. But importantly, um, they didn't feel more anxious the way that they would typically using um, the isoproterenol probe that I mentioned. So um, we have some uh, some ideas about what that uh, why that might be, and perhaps we can get into that in the in the Q and A. Um, we subsequently obtained a uh, feasibility uh, grant from the NC uh, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health to study the feasibility of uh, floating in a pool versus um, doing something similar in a chair. Like, why do you need water? Um, can't you just be in a room by yourself? And um, uh, theoretically, you could potentially do some of that, although um, there are some uh, key differences that we might be able to get into. Um, so in this study, we took 75 anxious and depressed individuals, uh, sort of a transdiagnostic sample, um, and randomized them to a preferred flow group, a prescribed, or uh, this zero-gravity chair, which controlled for um, uh, sort of was sort of an active comparator 
Um, and the idea here was to look at the impact of preference and the impact of duration as we're gaining in, in initial uh, data regarding safety and feasibility. Here's some safety data. So it's a lot uh, to see. Um, we'll break it down into the positive and the negative effects. So on this axis, uh, in this box on the top, um, anything with an asterisk shows a symptom that uh, in which the, um, uh, there was a group difference either uh, reflecting increases in the pool versus the chair. And you can see that the pool group um, did report uh, some uh, increase in fear or panic apprehension and some itchiness, uh, but importantly, no differences and also no increases in things like suicidal or homicidal ideation, thoughts related to death, et cetera. Um, and then in terms of the positive effects, we saw quite a number of instances in which um, floating in the pool um, had stronger uh, effects than uh, floating in the chair, feelings of relaxation, refreshment, peacefulness, pain-free existence, focus, energy, um, compassion for others. And then this um, hallucinations, which if you've seen the Altered States movie, there was uh, people do experience when you reduce their uh, visual input. Some people see like swirls or some people report hearing sounds, but it's not a typical um, hallucination in the standpoint of an individual on the psychosis spectrum. Um, and it's, uh, it's certainly um, not um, negatively experienced in our studies. Um, we've done some experience sampling to, to look. Uh, so after people floated, um, uh, across six float sessions, we, we would send them text messages and um, we would see how anxious or depressed or serene they felt. Um, and what you can see is that uh, the effects uh, averaged across the six sessions persisted for upwards of, of two days. So if you think about um, a benzodiazepine like lorazepam or alprazolam, which is much shorter acting, which we wouldn't recommend, how often do you uh, expect those effects to persist for that long of a period of time? Um, we did see some small evidence of a persist uh, of a of a building effect. So by the fifth and sixth float, um, people coming into float did report feeling less anxious, but that wasn't um, uh, that didn't extend to depression or the serenity measure. Um, we then started doing other studies. So we did a safety study in outpatients with anorexia nervosa, an area that I uh, a patient population that I study. Uh, this was an eight float uh, clinical efficacy trial that we published last year, where we randomized two thirds to eight sessions of, of floating. These were all inpatients versus measuring the same um, uh, 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 variables at eight different time points. Um, so this was usual care plus flotation rest or usual care with six week and six month assessments with um, good follow-up data. And what we found is that um, in these inpatients, we could induce reliably um, large reductions in anxiety um, and although the patient's anxiety levels tended to return to their baseline levels, uh, we had a really repeatable effect. Um, and this is the kind of effect that is clinically difficult to obtain with a benzodiazepine um, or uh, another anxiolytic medication like the beta blockers, typically contraindicated because these patients have bradycardia. So uh, a potential non-pharmacologic um, option for uh, uh, acute anxiety. That was actually our secondary outcome. Our primary outcome was um, a, a measure called body dissatisfaction, which is, which is a visual perceptual measure of how um, individuals see their current body in relation to the, the what's called their ideal body or the body that they want to have. Um, and we actually, um, it's a small effect, but it was uh, reliable and, and um, statistically significant um, that led us um, to, to think that there was some um, interesting um, effects, both on the interoceptive and extraceptive realm. Um, we've done some follow-up data, and this is uh, work led by Emily Choquette, who is a former postdoc in the lab, um, showing that um, there's actually um, changes in shape and weight concerns on uh, the eating disorder examination questionnaire, which is a standard measure of symptom severity that persists up to six months. Um, and when we've looked at the interoceptive signals, we're finding the same thing that we found in the anxious and depressed individuals. So increasing heartbeat and breathing sensations, uh, either no change or actually a decrease in the intensity of the signals that the patients were reporting, but not an increase in, in the negative uh, valence. In fact, it, universally, um, they're all they're reporting that these are being experienced in a positively balanced manner. Um, so that leads me to have some hope for uh, further applications of this um, uh, uh, the other thing that's interesting is that the more we're able to change heartbeat or breathing sensations, uh, the more uh, we're seeing that the, um, uh, by the, the, the uh, eating disorder symptoms are improved. Um, this has led to Emily's um, K Award, 
uh, focused on interoceptive mechanisms of body image disturbance in anorexia nervosa, funded by NIMH. And the basic rationale is that, um, uh, based on some theoretical uh, 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 writings, is that um, if people with anorexia nervosa um, have abnormal interoception and they really have trouble sensing what's happening inside their body, maybe that's something that facilitates an increased focus on extraceptive um, uh, signals related to their body um, and maybe related to sort of this body image disturbance where they see an image very different than what other people see. On the other, uh, and then that has uh, associated uh, cognitive and affective elements. But if we can modulate interoception um, and extraception um, with floating, perhaps we can um, uh, help to balance that out uh, and uh, improve body image and potentially have a, a broader impact um, on eating disorder um, uh, outcomes. So the last thing before we move on, uh, does anybody recognize what this is? This sort of setting, has anybody, have you ever seen images like this in the context of a, of a therapeutic intervention? Psychedelics, right. So psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, right. So 30-ish hours of psychotherapy paired with one to two administrations of a, of a, um, of a, um, a pharmacologic uh, agent that induces uh, altered states of consciousness, um, disembodiment, complex imagery. Um, and um, what's uh, intriguing here uh, is some, to me, is some similarities, right, that the participants' um, sound and light uh, processing and thermal processing is being modulated. So because of some of these similarities, we've looked at, um, uh, and the history of floating, we've looked at the uh, five-dimension altered states of consciousness scale. Um, and this is comparing, uh, on the left, anxious and depressed patients uh, floating relative to healthy individuals' um, uh, subscale reports on psilocybin, ketamine, or MDMA. And what you can see is that with the pool floating, um, you're getting levels of complex imagery that are somewhat uh, on a level with what you see with psilocybin. Um, and then with disembodiment, um, somewhat similar levels is what you see with ketamine, but this is not a pharmacologic effect. This is a non-pharmacologic effect. And so um, I think that there uh, could be some value um, uh, for uh, uh, from a perceptual standpoint to adapting some of the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy um, uh, um, de uh, interventions that have been developed um, to uh, look at um, what I like to call float assisted psychotherapy. Um, I think there's a lot of different um, avenues, both in terms of um, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, uh, psychotherapy integration. Um, uh, there's just a whole world of possibilities out there. Um, if you're interested in some societal um, uh, commentaries, um, uh, NPR recently came up with a six part mini series called Body Electric, um, that's sort of reflecting on the role of, uh, of technology um, uh, and its impact on the body. Um, uh, I was interviewed for the part five of that. Um, and then just last week, um, KPCC had a whole um, uh, 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 hour long special about the art of doing nothing. And there's a book if you want to read more about that. Um, so I'll just uh, summarize uh, that um, interoceptive neuroscience is a growing field. It offers a neurophysiologically grounded understanding of psychiatric disorders or aspects of psychiatric disorders. Homeostatic perturbations, I think, are going to be crucial in developing experimental therapeutics. Combining uh, bottom-up and top-down uh, perturbations, I think, could uh, be optimal from a neuroscience standpoint. Um, we're beginning to learn that interoceptive dysfunction um, goes beyond the insula. Um, uh, I haven't touched uh, uh, enough, I think, on the cross-cutting cross -cutting interdisciplinary applications. Um, both in terms of human and animal work, but also across disciplines in medicine. Um, I think the vibrating capsule and, and floating, I think, are, are some really um, worthwhile uh, options. But basically, we're really just at the beginning of, of exploring the vastness of interoceptive space. Um, and so um, I look forward to maybe coming back another time and sharing more. Finally, just a pitch, if you're interested in contemplative and mind-body uh, science, the International Society for Contemplative Research that I'm a part of, uh, the Executive Committee, we're having our second conference in Italy in June, and abstract submissions are currently open. So, thank you. I don't know how we do questions, and we're kind of at the hour, so. Mike, do you have a... Uh, are there questions online? I can't see you on so um, usually the people that are presenting. 
Let's see. Oops. That's not a question. Um, I have to. Uh, okay, chat. I see one. Oh, Q and A. Okay. Uh, with a resting heightened response. We didn't do the heightened response uh, before and after exercise, although we are currently um, involved in doing a study of the effects of exercise on inflammation um, at LIBOR. Um, let's see. Indigenous societies. I'm going I'm to skip to the last question. What if you fall asleep in the flotation tank? Uh, that's a common question. We have not, uh, in our studies that we've published to date, so we allow people to do whatever. Uh, so we, we, if people fall asleep, we, we ask that. Um, and I would say probably about 40% of the time, people do report uh, some period of time where they were sleeping. Sometimes we have an intercom, no cameras. We have an intercom. Sometimes you can hear people snoring. Um, and and it, you know, does that impact some of the potential effects? Possibly, but it's, it's usually not the whole time. Um, and uh, what we've been trying to do with our initial studies is just study people's behaviors um, with the intervention without any additional instruction to focus their attention. Um, I didn't go into this uh, a lot, but I think that um, uh, and, and some of uh, Emily Choquette's work is going to be focusing on this, where we're going to now start giving people guided instructions for how to interact with their body sensations, how to interact with their mental experience using uh, mindfulness-based um, uh, instructions um, with the idea that because this environment naturally enhances cardiac and respiratory sensations, it may provide people who have difficulty engaging in mindfulness with a, a, a stronger anchor that maybe then they can take out into the world take out into other kinds of individual or group level instruction um, and then have a benefit. Drowning, um, there, uh, there, are, I will, there are two published reports of people dying in a float tank. Um, in both cases, uh, the medical exam that um, was done um, found high levels of um, uh, various drugs um, in the bloodstreams of these individuals. And it's a reason why when we do our studies, we use um, urine drug screening and, and breathalyzer, and that would be a mandatory component of any kind of study or clinical use from my perspective. Um, but, uh, but when you think about the number of float centers and the broad application in society, it's actually very well tolerated, even in our studies in terms of safety and feasibility. Um, how often are recommended floats? Uh, we don't really have a recommend, I don't have a, a, I don't have enough data that would speak to that. And it would really depend on the application um, I think that it's it's something that could be um, investigated both in people who are running their own practices, but also there's a lot of science that could be done um, to really get get a better handle on this. And it may be it may be dependent on the clinical population and, and the moment in time when you when you engage people. Um, I think I'm going to leave it at that. And um, thank you for your time. <laughs>